We've derived the following equation for the shear stress when analyzing a rectangular bar under torsion with the assumption that the width is much larger than its height. Now if we equate this shear stress acting on the Z face in the horizontal direction with this expression, then we can relate the derivative of the warping function to the shear stress. And cancelling out the shear modulus and the rate of twist, and adding y to both sides, we get the partial derivative of the warping function with respect to x is minus y. So remember that the warping displacement was dependent on the rate of twist and the warping function, where the warping function was a function of x and y. So therefore the partial of the warping displacement with respect to z is zero. And this here is the assumption of free warping. So there's no axial strain in the z direction. So therefore, the partial derivative of w with respect to x is equal to the rate of twist multiplied by the partial derivative of the warping function with respect to x. So that would be negative y. So therefore, there's no warping rotation at y equals zero, and the largest warping rotation occurs at the top and bottom of the section. So the partial of w with respect to x at y equals h on two is minus theta by h on two. So negative meaning clockwise. And similarly, the warping rotation at y equals minus h on 2 is minus minus, which is a plus, theta h on 2. So this here is a counterclockwise rotation at the bottom of the section. So what this would look like is something like this. So this warping rotation is anticlockwise and it's constant along the x direction, as we can see. It only depends on y. So therefore the section will displace in a negative z direction on the left and a positive z direction on the right. And as we saw at the top, the warping rotation is clockwise. So the section would warp as follows with a clockwise warping rotation. So it will warp in the positive z direction over here and the negative z direction on this side. So using similar ideas for this I-beam, which is really a composite section, comprised of two thin flanges where the width of the flange is much larger than the height. And similarly you have the web with the height of the web being much larger than the width. So under torsion, this part of the web would warp out of the screen, and this part of the web would warp into the screen. And similarly at the bottom, you get warping of the web in the opposite sense. So therefore the flange is going to warp out of the screen on this side, and into the screen on this side. And this flange over here will warp in the opposite direction. So it's going to warp out of the screen here, and into the screen on this side. So for the top flange, we can visualize this in 2D over here, in the XZ plane, where we have our positive warping in the Z direction, on this side, and negative warping in the z direction on the other side. So note that here we also have the assumption of free warping. So based on our analysis of this rectangular bar, we assume that this top flange warps by an angle of minus theta by the height of the web on 2. So this here is a clockwise warping rotation. 
So effectively the warping angle is proportional to the distance from the centroid by the rate of twist, as we saw in the rectangular section. So effectively after the flange warps, the normal to the section here is going to remain normal to the section. And free warping means that this happens on the other side of the section such that the axial strain is zero. And similarly for the bottom flange, the warping angle is the rate of twist by the height of the web on two. So that would cause a counterclockwise rotation. So we see that the normal to the face of the flange remains perpendicular to the face after it warps. So this analysis on the assumption of free warping, so these angles over here, are going to be used when we look at the warping of I-beams that are restrained at their supports. So in that case they won't be free to warp.